I'm taking an hour if you can on the prayer board and pray it. Because time spent praying is not wasted. You know, there is power in prayer. When we pray, God hears. And not only does He hear, uh, but He answers when we pray according to His will. And actually, the hour, the need for most people's lives, and especially the, the climate that we're living in today, is prayer. You know, people need God today. People need God to break through. And it's only going to happen as the church begins to pray. So let's be, continue to be a praying church. You know, because when we pray, uh, God answers prayer. J. John put it like this when we uh, pray, Coincidences happen, yeah. and when we don't, they don't. <laughs> the truth is that God is a prayer answering God. And I'm wrapping up this morning, just really want to uh, give opportunity for those who uh, have a sickness or know somebody that has a sickness to pray. Uh, because we've heard this morning that God uh, has healed someone when we stood together and prayed. And I always say that testimony is a seed for more testimonies. Because what God done then, He can do again and again and again. Amen. Amen. And he wants to. Not only is he the God that's able, but, but he's willing. And this morning, I'm going to ask if you want to come down this morning and maybe stand as a representative for somebody else just to receive prayer today. That's what Steve did. You know, it was amazing. As he went down the prayer line, I went to pray for him. And God said, no, it's not for him. I said, Steve, is this for you? He said, no, it's for this young, young boy. And we stood together, we prayed for the church praying, and God answered. And that's what's going to happen today. So if you need prayer for yourself or for somebody else, uh, I'm just going to ask you to come forward whilst this song's praying and we're going to pray. And this is what the Bible says in James chapter 5 verse 14. It says, Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is there any sick among you? You know, let me tell you, the Bible puts the emphasis on you. If you're a believer, if you're sick, you call for the elders. Oh, hey, pray for me. Did you call for the elders? Did you ask for prayer? If you ask for prayer, you will get prayer. And it says anointed with oil, and it is the prayer of faith that will save the sick. And the prayer of faith is going to save the sick this morning. It's not going to be a long prayer. It doesn't have to be a long prayer. It's a prayer of faith with oil in the name of Jesus. And we're going to stand together and believe for healing. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Well, let's stand together. We'll just continue to worship. And if you just want to stand uh, in that gap for somebody today, we'll come forward and we'll pray together and agree together and believe. Like on the chip. Let's go with the enemy within. The enemy within. If you can't, no problem. Obviously, it knocks you out of sync, doesn't it? Not having the, the electric on and being able to organise. So, yeah, today starting a, a three-part series entitled The Enemy Within, or Exposing the Enemy Within. And over the next uh, three weeks, we're going to look at uh, witchcraft, uh, the spirit of Jezebel, and the spirit of Leviathan within the church. And actually, I just want to expose some stuff, because how many of you know that we're in a spiritual battle? But actually, you know, as much as there is a natural world, uh, there is a spiritual world. And in fact, the Bible says that the spiritual world is more real than the natural world because the real world came out of the spiritual world, uh, if that makes sense. And actually, there are forces of darkness that will come against us. You know, there's forces of darkness that uh, work within the world, but there's especially forces of darkness that would come uh, against the church. Because if we're saying that we're representing the kingdom of light, then we're at war with the kingdom of darkness. But the kingdom of darkness would seek to stop us doing what we're doing. The kingdom of darkness would stop us uh, preaching the gospel, uh, declaring Jesus Christ as Lord uh, and the way to the Father. But how many of you know that that ain't going to happen? Because we're here as the people of God. Uh, we're standing uh, in the power of God and we're going to do what God has called us to do and that is preach the gospel and make Jesus known uh, to this town and beyond. Uh, and it's going to happen. But something we need to be aware of is that the enemy will come against us. And I've said to you before, I don't mind the enemy without coming against us. He can come against us all day long because when the enemy without comes against us, it's with very little um, kind of effect, if you know what I mean. Uh, even where the church is persecuted the most, then it grows the most. But whenever the enemy is at, at work within, uh, it always causes the greatest of problems. And you know, there's times where I see stuff going on in the church, or God reveals stuff to me, or speaks to me, and I, and I get frustrated because I can see the enemy at work. Sometimes just through open doors, or the way that people would act, or the things that people would do. And I get frustrated, and I'm praying about it. But actually, the reason I get frustrated is because I, I see it and you don't. But only just recently, God has said that to me. 
The reason they don't see it is because you've not told them. And actually, we're going to look at some stuff today. You might not have heard it taught a lot, but actually, it's equipping you to see how the enemy is at work. Because he would seek to stay hidden. But actually, sometimes we think stuff's going on and it might seem all innocent or whatever. But actually, we're giving a door for the enemy to come in and uh, to cause problems, uh, divisions, dissensions, all these kind of things. Uh, when actually we should be on guard against those things. You know, we should be standing together. We should be standing on ground. We should not be being allowing the enemy to come in. Now, there are those people that would say, you know, would probably actually steer away from this kind of stuff and they would say, you know, just just get into the truth. All you need to know is plenty of the truth, not look at this, just, just look at Jesus and, and that's fine. And I would agree with that to some extent, but not, not whole, wholeheartedly. You know, yes, we do just need to look to Jesus, the victorious one, the one that's defeated the enemy, our King, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Yes, we do just need to look and to know uh, the truth and to have it abiding in our hearts and to be living and to be walking in it. But actually, there's no military force in the world that would go against an enemy, no matter how well equipped they were, no matter how trained they were, without knowing the enemy that they were facing. And actually, there's a great advantage in knowing the enemy that we face. In fact, the Apostle Paul said, we're not ignorant of his devices. We know how he works. We know what he's up to. And actually, the Bible is filled with stuff that reveals how the enemy works. Why? So that we can be on guard. So that we can be protected. So that we won't uh, get caught up in uh, any of these things. So today, I want to look at uh, witchcraft. And in particular, witchcraft in the church. Wow. <laughs> That might be a surprising title for you today. Uh, but you know, I want to say to you that actually sometimes witchcraft can be an operation in the church and people not even know about it. I want to put it to you that actually there can be good Christian people that are involved in witchcraft. See, there's two types of witches. There's those that know the witches, they practice as witches, they do the spells and all that kind of thing. And then there are those that don't know the witches, <laughs> uh, but are involved in witchcraft just the same. And I'm going to deal with the first type of witch first today, because that is a, a lot easier to deal with. And then we'll look at the second one after, which we might find is a, a lot more closer to home. But how many would say today that actually as a born-again believer, if it turns out that you know, I've been involved in witchcraft in some way, then I want to repent of that thing. You know, I want to get that out of my life. You know, because I only want to live and glorify God in my life. Okay, well to set the scene then, I just want to read two of the many verses in the Bible about witchcraft. Just to give us a, a mind and a, a thought of, you know, what God thinks about witchcraft. The first is in Deuteronomy 18, and it's verses 10 to 12. And it says, There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead, for all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. You know that verse starts off, the first bit is talking about anybody that would sacrifice their own children in a fire. And then he's putting witchcraft, sorcery, and all these other things in the same category. And then he says, it's an abomination to the Lord. Very strong language. It's an abomination. God detests uh, this kind of thing. Then in 2 Chronicles 33, 6, this is speaking of King Manasseh of Judah. It says, he sacrificed his children in the fire in the valley of ben Hinnom, practiced divination and witchcraft, sought omens and consulted mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing his anger. So just from those two verses, we get a, a picture of what God thinks about witchcraft and all of these kind of things. And actually, it's an abomination to him. Uh, it angers him. And if we've had any involvement in that whatsoever, you know, however lightly we might think it is, God does not overlook this kind of thing. You know, it's an abomination to him. It, it angers him. And if we've been involved in that in any way, then we need to repent. 
You know, sometimes today it's packaged up in all different kinds of ways and we might have think, thought, you know, we've done this in the past or this is harmless or whatever. Let me tell you, it's not. If we've done these things, God takes note. It is very, very serious. See, there's no grey areas with God. It's either black or white. It's either sin or it's not sin. It's either holy or it's unholy. You know, there's no middle ground. You know, we're either on one side or the other. And if we've been involved in any kind of witchcraft, then we need to repent of that. Even if it's in the past, even if it's before we got saved. You know, we need to get right with God about these things. Now, when it comes to witchcraft, there are three main areas. It comes under three main categories. Uh, the first, witchcraft itself, is really the power arm, and it operates through spells and curses and things like that. And then the second is divination, which is more a revelatory, revelation type of arm, if you like. Uh, and this operates through mediums, astrology, fortune tellers, Ouija boards, tarot cards, and all that kind of thing. Uh, and if you've had any involvement in that whatsoever, then there needs to be uh, a repentance of it. You know, sometimes people get deceived by these because they can be told things about them or told things about somebody else that oh, only, you know, they could know. No, it's familiar spirits. The Bible makes it quite clear. You know, you cannot speak to the dead. King David <coughs> said his son that died that, you know, one day I'll go to him, but he can't go to me. When we check out of this life, it's one-way traffic. You go that way, you don't come back. Nobody comes back. But there are familiar spirits at work to deceive people. And I've seen it. You know, when people are hurting and broken and the devil will move in, you know, to deceive. At that moment, bang, because he's like that. You know, and I saw, saw people that would believe in no form of spirituality get trapped in that because of a familiar and a deceiving spirit. If you've had any involvement in that, then you need to repent. The other type of witchcraft, the third type, is sorcery, which operates through objects. It can be ornaments in the home, it can be charms that you wear, uh, can even be drugs and music and things like that. <clears throat> we ain't got time to get into all that today. But you know, it's interesting talking about the music. You need to be careful what you listen to as well. You know, some of the secular music that might sound good and might seem good is not always good. I mean, some of the words you'll know will tell you it's not good. But actually, you know, sometimes there's actually a greater force at work. I remember hearing of a pastor uh, who did a lot of missionary work in Africa. Uh, coming back to his home, brought one of the guys with him from the mission field, one of the African pastors. And of course, while they're in the house, the pastor, the African pastor said to the other pastor, why is it your uh, son is playing music to call up demons? <laughs> but he didn't know that, it was dance music. But in Africa, it was a known thing that actually this was part of a, an occultic practice of, of raising up demons. We, we need to be careful. You know, in this country, you know, very much this spiritual stuff is it's kind of kept undercover, you know. And we live in a secular society that, you know, doesn't believe in this stuff. But let me tell you, it's very real. Uh, very, very real and very dangerous as well. Any supernatural power outside of God, and let me tell you, the devil will try and counterfeit everything that God does, um, is not good. It's dangerous. And actually can bring a curse upon your life. It needs to be repented of. Speaking of the uh, charms, are. Uh, they had one pastor praying for a guy and his leg was shorter than the other and he, he, he prayed for him for his leg to grow, didn't grow, prayed again for his leg to grow, didn't grow. And he noticed this bracelet on his wrist and he said to him, uh, what, what's the crap of the bracelet like? He said, oh, it's just something that my girlfriend gave me. He said, would you mind taking it off? He said, no. So he took this bracelet off. He said, the pastor didn't even have to pray for his leg to grow again. He shot out. It just shows the, the power of darkness blocking the blessing of God. And actually, we can carry charms and things like that, or even have objects in our home uh, that would block the blessing of God in our house. And even more than that, bring a curse uh, onto us as well. Things like Buddhas, you know, quite fashionable. People are having Buddhas here, there, and everywhere. If you've got a Buddha in your house, get rid of it. <laughs> it's, a, it's not good. It's, it's, it's a doorway. Horror movies. Should we be watching horror movies as Christians? 
I'm going to tell you straight today, we're having it straight, I mean, yeah, I know people that have needed deliverance from watching horror movies. If you're a Christian, don't watch them. I'm not messing about today, this is the reality. What fellowship has light with darkness? And if you've got that stuff in your home, it's a doorway for the enemy. You don't know what symbols are put in there, you don't know what it represents. If you put in something like that in your house, it's a doorway in the spiritual world to say you're welcome in my house. I don't know about you, there's only one spirit welcome in my house, and it's the Holy Spirit. And if you've got anything like that in your house, then you just need to get uh, rid of it and get it out. Any occult objects, Ouija boards, books on witchcraft and stuff like that, get rid of it. In the book of Acts, they burnt it. Acts 1919, 19, all the sorcerers got their books and they burned the lot. So it was 50,000, yeah. Millions of pounds today, that would be. That's true repentance, isn't it? Millions of pounds worth of books going up in smoke. But you've got to be careful what you have in your house. I don't even have the watchtower stuff in my house. We had to, had some Jehovah's Witnesses around yesterday. It's great, I love it. You know, I love it. They come to me, I ain't gonna go out, you know. Come to me. And uh, but anyway, one day they're on the door and, and Emma's being nice, you know, doing a bit of witnessing there, witnessing back and, you know, being nice and oh, can we just leave you with this, this leaflet? And then I can hear Emma along upstairs being ready to clear and go, yeah, I'll just take that. I'll come legging it down the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't coming in my house, I'm telling you. It ain't coming in my house. I ain't having it. All the best intentions in the world. Anyway, I'm digressing that. But it's the reality of it. Be careful. You know, the, the enemy is a deceiver. You know, don't give him the power. Also, objects from abroad, particularly Africa, or American Indian, or Chinese, you know, some of these stuff are known to be occultive objects, or objects um, kind of carved after demons, really, yeah, and effigies and things like that. So, but this is serious stuff, friends. You know, these are doorways, and you're allowing the enemy into your life and into your home. And if you've got any of this stuff in your house, then, then you need to get rid of it. And I always say, if in doubt, chuck it out. And if you don't know, ask God. He will tell you. Just ask God. He'll tell you straight away. Whilst we're at it as well, <laughs> things like Reiki, yoga, that needs to be repented of as well. You know, I know people, oh, yoga seems to be this great uh, modern kind of exercise type thing. Again, I know people that need deliverance from doing yoga. You know, if you look at the roots of yoga, it's, it's demonic. It's rooted in Hinduism. And, and like I said, I've got to get through all this, so I can't digress. I'm just touching on stuff. All right, okay. If you want to talk to me more after, we'll, we'll, we'll talk after. Um, but also, as well, martial arts, the spiritual dangers with, with martial arts. And you say, oh, he's going over the top now. No, 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 I've seen it. I'm not I'm just saying it for the sake of it. I've seen it. You know, and actually, it's my my duty, my, my job to tell you and to preach the truth to you, you know, and to open this uh, up to you if you didn't already know. So speaking then of, of witches and witchcraft and things like that, you'll know that it's Halloween on Wednesday. Uh, it's great how that come. I didn't plan it this way, I just felt God wanted me to speak on this stuff, but actually it fits, doesn't it? <laughs> Praise God, this time is better than ours. Um, but what about how should Christians ha handle Halloween? Well, the Bible says, what fellowship does light have with darkness? You know, should we be involved in Halloween? No, not at all. Should we be aligning ourselves with witches and witchcraft and the dead? No, not at all. We shouldn't be doing those things uh, whatsoever. You know, witches believe that Halloween is, well, it, Halloween is one of their most important days of the year. They believe it's when the veil between this world and the next world is the thinnest. So a lot are at work doing uh, rituals and spells and all that kind of thing. And actually some witches are involved in praying against the church. You know, Satanists and witches are very active in praying against the church. You need to, to understand that and know that. And the two main things that they pray for is the breakup of Christian marriages and the fall of Christian leaders. Why? Because it causes the most damage. Some churches don't recover from that kind of stuff. You know, damages a lot of people, a lot of Christians, and actually we need to be praying uh, in response to that. In fact, next week we should be praying, um, I was going to say against that, but we don't really pray against, we just pray for the things of God. You know, someone said that if uh, there's darkness in the room, you don't pray, um, 
you know, against the darkness, you just go and switch on the lights. Hallelujah. And we should be spending all this week just switching on the light. Praising and praying to God and reading out the scriptures and praying blessing. You know, praying for one another. Praying for Christian marriages. Praying for leaders. Uh, praying for the protection of children. And just switching on the light. So let's really, you know, stand together and uh, pray this week against some of these things. We do have a load of Christian tracks downstairs, so if you have trick-or-treaters come to your door, then we've got some nice tracks, you can give them a treat and a, and a tract. You know, use the opportunity to witness and share Jesus. Um, so feel free to grab one of those or a few of those before you go. Um, so how many you think people you might think you'd have uh, come in around your house? So anyway, then the first kind of witchcraft is obvious, and I think that we'd all recognise some of that stuff and know to stay clear of it. But the second type of witchcraft is not so obvious. The first type of witchcraft we looked at is the spiritual force of witchcraft. But next I want to look at as witchcraft as a work of the flesh. And actually, this is the witchcraft that you find at operation in the church more often than not. In fact, anywhere where there's an authority, you'll find that this type of witchcraft um, at work. Because the first thing that we need to understand is that witchcraft really is about control. It's to control something. So whether that's through sorcery, whether it's through divination, the casting of spells or whatever, the end game is always control. And whenever you see witchcraft as a work of the flesh, it's the same. Because actually that witchcraft which is spiritual, is rooted in the work of the flesh, which is witchcraft. See, in Galatians 5, chapters, verses 19 to 21, it says, The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is talking to the church, by the way. But here in Galatians 5, witchcraft is listed not as a spiritual force, but as a work of the flesh. And actually that word witchcraft there comes from the Greek word pharmakia. And pharmakia is where we get our modern day pharmacy from. And pharmacy speaks of drugs and medicines and things like that. And the kind of thought behind this in regards to witchcraft is to be under the control. As in, you can be under the control or influence of drugs. Uh, to be in witchcraft is to be under the control of, of somebody else. Now the best kind of definition that I've found uh, for witchcraft of the flesh is this. It says, the root of witchcraft is the carnal desire to dominate, manipulate, intimidate and control. And actually, this happens uh, more than you can imagine, uh, especially uh, in the church. And actually, it's something that we need to be on guard against, because actually, if we're involved in anything kind of in the soulish realm, it then can enter into the spiritual realm as well. In James chapter 1, in James chapter 3, sorry, verses 14 to 5, it speaks about uh, earthly, soulish, devilish, or demonic. And that's very often... Um, the root that something will take that actually it's in the world, you know, it's appealing to the flesh that actually when we get engaged in it, it's in our heart and it's something that we do that's soulish, but then it can become devilish, but actually you're giving an open door to the enemy so if you're involved in witchcraft or any other sin, you know, it, it can be soulish, but if we're not careful it becomes devilish, and that's why the Bible says give no place to the devil, actually we can give the devil a place, that when we step outside of the, the law and the authority of God, and as we operate in the flesh and not the spirit, it can give a place to the enemy. It's something that we need to be on guard of today. But in 1 Samuel chapter 15 and, and verse 23, it says that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. But the Hebrew literally says rebellion is witchcraft. See, rebellion and witchcraft go hand in hand, the two sides of the same coin. Wherever you see rebellion, you see witchcraft. Wherever you see witchcraft, you see rebellion. And actually we see both of these things take place in this uh, story here in Samuel chapter 15 where God sent the prophet Samuel to go and speak to Saul and he says, I want Saul, I want you to go and defeat the 
Uh, Amalek, I want you to destroy everything. I want you to destroy uh, all the animals as well. So Saul goes uh, in obedience to that, starts to destroy everything, but he doesn't destroy all the animals. He keeps some back for himself. He probably thought, yeah, we're going to have a good party tonight. You know, we're going to, this is too good to waste. And when the prophet, Saul turned, prophet Samuel turned back up again, Saul said, I've done everything that you said. And the prophet said, well, that's funny, because I can hear some sheep bleating in the background. <laughs> I can hear some cattle moving about. So all of a sudden, he's, he's making excuses. He's going, oh, no, we kept that back. So we're going to sacrifice that to God. You know, it's amazing how often rebellion and witchcraft is covered with spiritual talk. Oh, it's okay. It's going to be for greater good. You know, oh, it's okay. I was just helping them out. You know, I was helping the pastor. Uh, so not only did he rebel, but actually he used witchcraft as well. And the difference between rebellion and witchcraft, actually, rebellion is to ignore legitimate authority. Witchcraft is to take a legitimate authority. So if you're not ignoring authority, that's rebellion. But then when you want to take authority or control authority or operate outside a sphere of authority that's not yours, then that's witchcraft. And it's usually done through manipulation and intimidation in order to bring domination. That's how somebody, if somebody wants their will, it's, it works out of self-centeredness. I want my way. Oh, I think it should be done like this. But I don't have the authority to do it, so what am I going to do? I'm going to manipulate someone, I'm going to control them. You know, Jezebel in the Old Testament was the greatest example of this. Because we'll look at some of this next week. But she was a lady who was married to King Ahab. King Ahab, he wasn't a very good king, but he was a powerful king. And he controlled the kingdoms of Israel. But actually, Jezebel controlled him to control the kingdom. She did it through manipulation and intimidation, and that's how witchcraft works. Operating outside the sphere of her authority, but she thought I can control him to control the kingdom. See, wherever there's an authority in place, you need to be on guard for rebellion and for witchcraft. See, he rebelled against God, sold him by not listening to what God had said. You know, oh, it, it's all right, we just kept some back for, uh, for, for a sacrifice. That's where he came in then, and the prophet said, well, actually, Obedience is better than sacrifice. Do you think God wanted your sacrifices? Do you think God wanted all of these animals sacrificing? No, he wanted your obedience. He wanted you to recognize his voice, to walk under his authority. But he rebelled. And not only did he rebel, that was to ignore the legitimate authority. He then operated in witchcraft by making a sacrifice that he had no business to make a sacrifice for. See, that was outside the sphere of his authority. He might have been king of Israel, but it was the prophet and the priest's authority. It was their sphere of authority to make the sacrifice. And he's waiting around, oh, where's, where's the prophet? Oh, he's not come, I'm going to do it myself. Witchcraft stepped out of his sphere of authority. And actually in Chronicles, it says that the reason that uh, God took the king, the state of his king from him, and the reason that he died was for two reasons. One, he disobeyed God, and two, he consulted him video. Rebellion and witchcraft was the downfall of King Saul. You getting this today? Yes. yes. You understanding this? Yeah. Okay. So to help us understand it a little bit more, uh, there are five main spheres of authority. Uh, the first is the authority of God. In Psalm 103, verse 19, it says, The Lord has established his throne in heaven. And his kingdom rules over all. God is the highest authority. God is over everything. And actually, if we're walking correctly under the authority of God, then we're walking correctly in every other sphere of authority. But in the same way, if we step out of a sphere of authority somewhere else, then we're outside of the authority of God, because all authority comes from him, uh, and he rules over it all. The second sphere of authority is the authority of government. Romans 13, 1 and 2, it says, All of you must obey the government rulers. Everyone who rules was given the power to rule by God. And those who rule now were given that power by God. So anyone who is against the government is really against something God has commanded. You know, we might not always agree with the government, but God put that in place. And we need to be respectful of the government and actually live under that sphere of authority. 
Actually, you break the law, you go to prison. <laughs> it's that simple, isn't it? But the Bible says that we should live uh, rightly under that law and obey the government rulers. Number three, there's the authority of the employer. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 to 6 says, Servants, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favour when their eye is on you, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. So the Bible there tells us, you know, those that are employers, those that are over us, to respectfully honour them and live how we should. If we don't, we get sacked. <laughs> so we're going to go find a new employer. <laughs> then there's the authority of the home. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. Child or children, obey your parents, for this is right. And all the parents said, Amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> then it says, Ephesians 5, 22 to 25, it says, Wives, submit uh, to your husbands, for he is the head. <laughs> I knew it wasn't going to be a big amen. But, uh, yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> you, you ready, ladies? You ready, ladies? Husbands, love your wife like Christ loves the church. <laughs> but you know, this is the first sphere of authority that actually God put in place, if you like. And He gave a uh, man. Uh, to be the lead in that, you know, men and, and women together, they're equal, they're one flesh, but actually the man has the, the role to lead. And actually it talks there about wives being submissive, and being submissive is an attitude, not an action. You know, it doesn't mean you have to obey everything that he says, but actually you have a submissive heart. But actually if the man's ruling well and he's loving his wife like Christ loves the church and gave himself for the church, and then he's ruling well, but actually it doesn't mean that he's got to make all the decisions. Amen. A good leader of the home can say, let's go get some amens right now. <laughs> a good leader of the home can say, honey, you, you know more about this. I think you're right in this. You know, you work together, don't you? You know. Um, anyway, let's move on. We'll get stuck here, right, don't we? <laughs> some some counselling could be there. <laughs> But again, actually, in, in this, you know, witchcraft can operate in the family home as well. You know, the kids seek to manipulate or, or to intimidate. And actually, normally, uh, they say with a woman being the weaker vessel, it's not always the case, but normally, you'll find the, the man, when it happens, it will co come by um, intimidation, control will come by intimidation, you know, anger and kicking. Oh, it doesn't happen in Christian homes, does it? But, but I'm just trying to get you to, to, to see how, how this thing might work, but also, you know, a woman more often than not being a weaker vessel will use manipulation, tears, and you know, saying certain things, and that's very <laughs> That's it. But you know, you know, yeah, I'll say it anyway, but. <laughs> Go on, Greg. You know, if, if your wife then tell you something, fear of you losing it, that's control by intimidation. That's a bad lead. And actually, wives, if you're not telling your husband something or you think you've got to tell it on a certain spin, that's manipulation. And actually, you need to sort that stuff out. You need to come together, uh, you know, and anyway, okay. <laughs> we'll get through this, we'll get through this. Okay, so the final authority, and this is where I'm going, the authority of the church, Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls, as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. So I'm hoping you're getting that picture this morning. It might be something new to you, uh, but the witchcraft it seeks to control the sphere of authority. And it mainly does it through manipulation and intimidation to bring domination and to control that. And we see it take place even within the church. And now I'll give a bit of teaching and some examples from the Bible. I just want to give you some examples in the church. <laughs> Hopefully this will help you to see and to guard against it. So if rebellion is ignoring legitimate authority, you see that take place in the church all the time. That actually, you know, some people rock up to the church and you know, there's no submission to the church. 
don't want to be a part of the church, they just want to come in and take from the church. Uh, but that's wrong. You know, it's okay for visitors to come and do that, everybody's welcome. But actually, if you, you're, you're part of the church, if you're a Christian, if you're walking with God, then you need to be connected to the local church <coughs> and go, kind of walk with the church. Amen? Amen. 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 So I do a side down side, do a side down side, so I'm screw with it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we had someone come in, you, you, you asked for it, so. I mean, we, we've had someone come in recently, you know, can't align with the church, you know, don't believe some of the stuff that the church is saying, but think they're just going to come in, use the church for whatever they want, and go in and out, in and out. No, you're not. It's not happening here. This is not how it works. Read your Bible. It doesn't work like that. You know, if you're a believer and you're walking with God, you need to be accountable. There's no lone rangers in the kingdom of God. We're all answerable to somebody. We're all submissive to somebody. You know, that's how it works. And actually, God puts some of these things in place, authorities in place as a protection. Why? So people can't walk in and out and do whatever uh, they want to do. You know, it's a protection. You know, the Bible talks about God and about wolf, wolves coming in. Because if wolves come in amongst the flock and amongst the lambs, there will be carnage. That's why authority is in place. Protection. You know, the same in the family home, the man, having that lead role actually is about protection. It's about protecting the wife, about protecting the children. You know, there, need, there needs to be protection for all of us. You know, a spiritual uh, protection. So that's the area of rebellion then, no regard to, to church authority. You know, when the church says, we're doing this and they don't want to do it. But we don't do this and they go and do it. <laughs> That's a rebellion. Witchcraft then. You know, there are those who take it upon themselves to, you know, be involved in, in ministries without the church knowing about it. There are those that put themselves in, in appointed positions. There are those that say, oh, the church is doing this, that and the other and the church know nothing about it. You know, I had somebody ring me up and gone around organising a load of stuff and then said to me, the church is doing this. I'm like, that's funny because I know nothing about it. And if the church was doing it, we'd do it a lot better than that. <laughs> you know, we'd do it properly, we'd organise it properly. Well, I'll call that out for what it is, witchcraft, taking an authority that you don't have. You don't have the authority to go and do the church is doing this. <laughs> Come and ask me. And we have a church council as well, about five or six people. You know, even I ain't alone canon. You might not believe it, but I'm not. <laughs> we you know, there's accountability, you know, to one another. There's ways that we do things. The way that the Bible has put things uh, down as well. You know, we had a situation here in the church and this kind of thing happens all the time. Uh, there was a, a leader of a department said to the department, we're not doing this. The department went ahead and did it anyway. And then guess what? It was the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. <laughs> no, it wasn't. It's amazing how many times the God card gets pulled. It's almost like, I'm invincible, I can do what I like, because God says, bang. No, you can't. Even God does things properly. Hallelujah, it's the God of order. Even God doesn't, you know, if he's setting an authority in place, you know, he works within that authority. If you're pulling the God card to do whatever the hell you like, it ain't God. I'll tell you right now. Amen. See, even King David could have, Kill King Saul, maybe justifiably, twice. But he never would. Why? Because he knew it was outside his sphere of authority. You know, God had made him king. God better sort it out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I know this ain't the, the best preacher in the world, guys, but if you just bring some understanding into your mind, that's all I want to do, just so we can, you know, understand this and see what's going on at times. Okay, so this manipulation then. What does that look like in the church? And this is the this is the big one. This happens in all different kinds of guises. You know, I'm not, you know, amazed at the, the different ways manipulation could come in. People pray manipulatively. You get power sermons in a prayer. We should be doing this, we should be doing that. No, we shouldn't. <laughs> Prophesy manipulatively. You know. Uh, calm down, Craig, calm down. <laughs> But the greatest one is this in the church. Watch out for this. You call yourself a Christian. But where's the love? You don't love me. 
Watch out for the crowbar of love. You know, if you feel guilty, if you feel moved by guilt, let me tell you, it's not God. That's manipulation. They tried that on Jesus, you know. When Lazarus was on his sick bed, sick bed, you know where he was. <laughs> deathbed. On his deathbed, he was sick on his deathbed. In John 11, 3, Mary and Martha sent word out to him. He said, Jesus, the one who you love is sick. The one who you love. Grow water and love. Come on, Jesus, come and heal him. You love him. I believe that's the reason it took Jesus four days to turn up. Could have took him a few hours, maybe a day. He wasn't going to be moved by manipulation. Jesus wasn't going to be manipulated, and neither, neither should you. Amen. Amen. So if you feel that cry of love, you don't love me. Come on. Don't be moved by it. Only be moved by God. That's what Jesus did. In fact, even when they turned, Jesus turned up, they did it again. Verse 21. Martha said to Jesus, if you'd been here, you know, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus cried in his spirit. Jesus didn't act out of manipulation. He acted on God for God, for the glory of God. And that's what we should do. I'm just saying, you know, be on God for that stuff, church. If you feel that you've got to do it because someone's twisting you or something, that ain't God. If the Holy Spirit tells you to do it, you do it. You know? Amen. 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 And finally, intimidation. And I've got to say, personally, I, I, I know it goes on, but I haven't come across this too much in the church on the grounds of intimidation. But I remember once there was somebody that was trying to, wanted me to do something they wanted to do. And after months of pressure, I've got to tell you, if God ain't saying to me, I ain't doing it. You know what I mean? There's the one I'm answerable to. And after months, I think of pressure and pressure. There must have been a frustration there. But in the end, they turned around and said to me, they didn't say directly, but they intimated, and if I didn't do what they thought God would have me do, then God would take me out. So it's threatening me with death. <laughs> Hashtag witchcraft. Intimidation, manipulation. Not wanting to control the situation. This is what I want. This is where I want to be. So I'm going to make you do it. No, you're not. No, you're not. Amen. <laughs> now we're in for time. Okay, cool. <laughs> so this is really twofold today. You know, one, search your hearts. You know, where are we at? You know, are we submissive to God alone and uh, following His leading and following His guiding? But two, as well, to be on guard. Not to let things come in. You know, certainly any manipulation or intimidation or anyone trying to control the situation. Because what happens is sometimes, you know, people feed in stuff that ain't even true. And it's about manipulating the situation. And what happens is everybody takes hold of it and starts speaking about it. And it's, it's, amazing. it's amazing what I'm finding out what's going on in the church that I didn't even know about. Just amazing. But everyone takes this gospel and all kinds of stuff going on. But finally then, and we'll touch this briefly, and we'll come around the table together. Um, I've talked in talk of this witchcraft as Christianity. And if you look at the, the Galatian church, the Galatian church was the church that you might say walked in witchcraft as Christianity. Now the Apostle Paul, out of all the letters that he wrote, this was the only letter where he didn't start with any nice greetings, where he didn't, you know, bless them and, you know, get them in, get, get it really nice. Actually, he just went straight in and lambasted them. You know, he's very strong with them. And in verse, chapter 3, verse 1, he said, Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who has bewitched you? In other words, they believed something else that wasn't the truth, that actually they'd allowed uh, something to come in and uh, uh, obscure their view of the cross, that actually they started out in grace and walking in the spirit, but then they found themselves in legalism, 
In other words, they started living their Christian life uh, in the flesh. You know, it's possible to live your Christian life in the flesh. And normally people of control will do that. I've got this God. This is how I'm going to do it. This is how I'm going to walk it out. I'm going to control this thing. But you can't because the flesh and the spirit are contrary to one another. You know, we can't live Christianity ourselves in the flesh. If you try and live it in the flesh, you get religion. And a lot of churches are in religion. They rely upon what they can do in the flesh. But if you rely on what you can do in the flesh, then you're not relying on what he done in the flesh, which was to die upon the cross for each and every one of us, uh, so that we might be born again uh, of the Spirit of God. See, I love it. If I can find it. Now, the Apostle Paul, he was very, very strong to the Galatian church. Saying stuff like, you know, I'm afraid of you. Let's, let's, I laboured amongst you in vain. Though I, I might not have no spiritual fruits against you. You know, who's bewitched you that you've gone away from the Lord Jesus Christ? And Derek Prince gives these kind of, what shall we, what shall, shall we say, the, the differences between the flesh and the spirit and actually how it's possible to try and do a spiritual thing in the flesh. And actually it's witchcraft. Why? Because it's an illegitimate authority. You know, the flesh <coughs> doesn't have the authority to live for Christ. You know, it's the spirit of God. We should be walking in the spirit. So there's the carnal via the spiritual. In fact, it's like Ishmael v. Isaac. You know, God gave Abraham a promise, didn't he? That he'd have this son in his old age. And he received this promise and he said, okay, God, I'm going to go and do it myself. He went and done it in the flesh. What did he produce? He produced the Ishmael. But actually, God had planned for him a Jacob. That was the spiritual promise. But it shows you that actually God might have even spoken to you. He might have even told you, you know, where you're going to be, what you're going to do. But that doesn't mean you have to go and do it in the flesh. You know, God will get you there. If God's promised it, he'll make it happen. But actually, sometimes we're so fleshly or carnal or, or wanting to control that it's all right, God, I've got the promise now, I'll go and do it. But how many of you know that when we try and do it, we end up with an Ishmael and not a Jacob? And actually, Ishmael caused a lot of problems, a lot of family problems going on there. The other thing is, as well, carnal be spiritual. The carnal will rely more on theology where the spiritual relies on the re revelation of God. You know, there are some theologians know more theology than any, anything else. And they're not even saved. You know, you can know the, all the Bible inside out and know all the theology and not even be saved. But let me tell you, you cannot have revelation and not be saved. You know, Jason prayed about us having a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. You know, revelation will take you further than theology. See, you can know all the theology. I can know the Bible inside out, but not know Him. But you cannot have revelation and not know Him. It's the flesh being the Spirit. Are we living in the Spirit or are we living in the flesh? See, the flesh would have education while the spiritual would have the discipling. You know, the church has been good at this in the past. Let's send them all to Bible college and we'll educate them, educate them, educate them, educate them. We'll give them certificates, certificates, certificates. Yeah, yeah. What did Jesus do? He discipled them. He didn't take them to a classroom, sit them down in education. He discipled them on the job. You know, they didn't turn up with certificates. No, they turned up with the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Forget the certificates. I'm not against these things, by the way. But I know what I'd rather have. You know what I'm saying? Some of these are good. But that's the best. That's what you want. Again, program the spiritual direction. So program, let's rock up. Okay, it's five past, let's say the prayer. Ten past, let's stand up, sing a hymn. The program, the program, the program. And yes, we need program. You know, we need an idea. I'll tell you what, you know, if God turns up in the middle of the service and says, Craig, do this, guess what? That's what we're going to do. Because what he says, what the Spirit wants is more needful than program and everything that my flesh can do or wants to do. Psychology, be discernment. Uh, Oh, let's work it out here. Oh, you've got some problems there. So psychologists have the most problems. <laughs> don't, don't even get me started on, on them. They can't even sort their own heads out. So forget them. <laughs> but actually, the need is discernment. 
The Spirit of God can tell you something in one second. The years of, of, of psychology and all that stuff would never know. I'm not sure if they go to university for years for that. The Spirit of God gives it like that. Praise God. Hallelujah. And let me tell you why we're talking about that, spiritual gifts as well. Any spiritual gift that you can control is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will not be controlled. Now if you say, I've got this healing, I'm going to give this healing, I'll give this word, and I'll control it. That ain't the Holy Spirit. You don't control the Holy Spirit. He's God. Hallelujah. And He doesn't even control you. He just asks you to submit to Him, to yield to Him. If you're open to Him, He'll say, Psst, this is what's going down. But you've got to listen to Him. And then you've got to be obedient and act on it. So just be careful. If you control that Spirit, it ain't the Holy Spirit. And we've got eloquence, the supernatural power. Praise God. <laughs> I wish I had some more eloquence. But more than that, I wish I had spiritual power. Forget the eloquence. Conviction brings conversion. There was reasoning. Be the walk of faith. You know, I've got to work this thing out. This Christianity, I've got, I've got to work it out. X, Y, and Z. A, B, C. But actually, the Bible says that we walk by faith. The just shall walk by faith. It's the daily walk with God. We ain't got to have it all worked out. He's got it all worked out. I'll just trust him and walk with him. And he'll get me where I need to go. And this is the greatest one, and I'll, I'll leave this here. It's legalism versus love. That's the greatest test of all. You know, I speak to some guys, they know so much of the Bible, so critical. Oh, why are you not doing this? Why are you not doing that? Oh, what it says here, it says there. Not one ounce of love. If you've got no love, forget it. Love is the acid test of Christianity. I don't care how much Bible you know. I don't care how well you can do this, that, and the other. Where is the love? Legalism versus love. Legalism is in the flesh, you see. It's what I can achieve. It's what I know. It's how I can live my Christianity. But actually, the Spirit of God within me is love. It's love. It's about relationship. It's about me and Him. It's about me and you. It's about you and Him. It's all about... Amen. 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 Well, we're going to come around the table this morning. I know I've tried to cover a lot. And as I say, it's not a, a jump up and down sermon. But just hopefully that would just have opened your, your minds and your hearts to some stuff. But actually, witchcraft is a work of the flesh. It's sin. And if we've been involved in it in any way, you know, manipulation or intimidation or trying to, you know, enforce my will and get what I want, then it's sin. And we need to repent of that. If we've been involved in the occultic practices of witchcraft, in any way whatsoever, even the reading of horoscopes, you know, in the paper, oh, this is nothing. It's not nothing to God. We need to repent of those things. Any spiritual involvement that's not been the Holy Spirit, we need to repent of that. And as well as living our Christian life uh, in the flesh, trying to do it my way. But actually, we would say, God, no, today we want to do it your way. We want to live according to the Spirit. So can we stand together, church? <laughs> so we're going to come around the table in just a moment. So let's just uh, bow our heads together in prayer. Just want to spend a few moments just allowing the Holy Spirit just to search our hearts. Of course, the Bible says before we come to the table that we should examine our hearts. But this morning I want to respond directly to this message. I want to lead us all in a prayer of repentance today. Repenting of witchcraft in its spiritual form. Repenting of witchcraft uh, as a work of the flesh. And repenting as, as witchcraft uh, as our faith of living in the flesh. So as I pray today I'm going to ask if you'd all join me. And we'll just pray through this. And bless him today. But let's pray, pray together. Lord Jesus Christ. Sounds like a conviction, church. <laughs> Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ. We come to you today. We come to you today. We thank you. We thank you. And we love you. And we love you. And we come before you. And we come before you. And we repent, and we repent of, all sin, of all sin, especially witchcraft. Especially witchcraft. 
in whatever form, in whatever form I've been involved in. I've been involved in. Whether a spiritual force, a, spiritual force a, work of the flesh, a work of the flesh, or within the church, or within the church I, repent, I repent and ask you, and ask you to, forgive me, to forgive me. Wash me in your blood, wash me in your blood as, I yield my life to you, as I yield my life to you and submit, and submit to your authority. Your authority and the, leading and the leading of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, in, my life, Spirit in my life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Lord, today, as we just uh, prepare our hearts to come around the table right now, Lord, we just consciously want to make you Lord of our lives once again, that you would just be Lord over every area. Lord, we thank you for the table, Lord. We thank you for what it represents, uh, for your broken body and for your shed blood. And Lord, as we just uh, participate in the table now, may we just know that your Holy Spirit uh, moving amongst us, uh, touching and blessing each and every one. In your name, amen.